is a WMUR Commitment 2020 special in partnership with the New Hampshire Institute of Politics, the Granite State Debates. Tonight, the candidates for the first congressional district. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Tonight, we're hearing from the candidates who want to represent New Hampshire's first congressional district from the state's largest city to the seacoast and up to the Mount Washington Valley. This debate is live, but things will look a little different because of COVID-19 precautions. Our candidates are socially distant in their studio. I'll join them in a moment. The panelists will stay in this studio. Tonight, we're joined by WMUR anchor Monica Hernandez and political reporter John DeStaso. Everyone can see and hear each other, so we should be able to cover a lot of ground tonight. But first, let's start with a look at the candidates' backgrounds. In New Hampshire's first congressional district, a one-term incumbent faces a challenger with the weight of the White House behind him. Democrat Chris Pappas has represented New Hampshire's first congressional district for the last two years. Born and raised in the Granite State, the restaurant owner and former executive counselor says he's representing the values of New Hampshire. I think the voters of this district deserve someone who knows New Hampshire. Republican Matt Maurer says he has spent time in New Hampshire dating back to childhood and now looks forward to raising his family here. He worked for the New Hampshire Republican Party and in President Trump's State Department before launching an international political consulting firm. I'm going to go down there and be a champion for New Hampshire's working class families every single day. The candidates have starkly different opinions on things like strategies for police reform and how to help the economy rebound from COVID-19. But which plan will be most convincing to Granite Staters? We've got to look to bring people together around solutions. Folks are ready for a new generation of leadership to go down to Washington, D.C. WMUR News 9 evaluated all legally qualified candidates and selected those considered most newsworthy according to its objective criteria to participate in this debate. Candidates will get one minute to answer questions tonight. 30 second rebuttals will be allowed at the moderator's discretion. Thank you for joining us tonight, gentlemen, and I will begin with the opening question tonight, and it goes first to Congressman Pappas. People are tired. COVID-19 has taken its toll physically and mentally. Social justice movements have brought up raw emotion. Now, Granite Staters are faced with a choice of politicians to lead them. How can you be the leader that New Hampshire needs in this moment? Well, thank you, Adam, for hosting, and it's an honor to join you all, and it's an honor to represent my home community in Congress. It's a place where I grew up, where my family runs a 103-year-old local business, and I learned everything I know about the world around me through that experience. I learned about uh, every day being an all-hands-on-deck sort of day. I learned about looking out for the greater community, and I learned to be of use. And right now, everyone has a role to play as we confront COVID-19. We need to bring our country closer together around solutions. And it is going to take someone who knows New Hampshire to get the job done. And it's going to take someone who has worked across the aisle to build bridges in Washington to produce results. You know, I mean what I say in my TV ads. Every day is a chance to help people. And I'm focused on how I can help the people of New Hampshire through this really tough time. So I look forward to the conversation here tonight. You know, Matt Mowers has run a campaign to date of fear and smear. I think we've got to turn the page and take our democracy to a higher place where we're responding to the needs of everyday Granite Staters and working to make progress in Washington. Mr. Mowers, how can you be the leader need, that New Hampshire needs in this moment? Well, thank you, Adam, and thank you, WMUR, for organizing tonight. Congressman, great to see you. Uh, you know, look, during this whole COVID pandemic, my wife, Cassie, and I were like a lot of folks, trying to help neighbors, trying to step up where we could. We met small business owners doing the same thing. But unfortunately, while our communities were rising to the occasion, Congress was letting us down. You know, Congressman Pappas stood on this stage two years ago, looked in the camera, looked you in the eye, and said a bunch of things he didn't follow up on when he got to Washington, D.C. He looked in the eye for, at this stage at middle-class families and small business owners, said he would champion them. But instead of championing them, he's now currently championing one of the largest tax hikes in American history down in Washington, D.C. Instead of helping small businesses get the relief they need, they continue to play politics. And today, the Paycheck Protection Program that so many small businesses need access to is being stalled. Congressman Pappas looked law enforcement in the eye, said he would champion them. But instead, he went to Washington, D.C. and sided with Nancy Pelosi when she stripped away qualified immunity from our law enforcement, a critical protection that protects them from the criminals that they arrest. We need someone to go to Washington, D.C. and be an independent voice for New Hampshire, not just someone who's going to vote 100 percent of the time with Nancy Pelosi. All right. You've both taken some shots there in that first statement, but let's get to our first question and we can unpack things as we go from there. Let's go to Monica Hernandez. 
Mr. Mowers, the president has told Americans not to let COVID-19 dominate them, that they're going to beat it. But more than 220,000 Americans have died from the virus so far, including 469 people in New Hampshire. New coronavirus cases in the U.S. continue to climb, and some hospitals say they're close to ICU capacity. Is the president's view that people should not be afraid of the virus because it's easy to beat realistic? Well, Monica, thank you so much. You know, it's a tragedy any time that we have a loss of life, of course. You know, I've taken this pandemic seriously from day one. That's why I was the first candidate in the country to call for travel restrictions from China. Something, by the way, that Congressman Pappas opposed at the time, even sponsoring legislation that would have That's restricted the ability to do it. It is true, That's not true. And not only that, um, I've worked on these issues before. I was chief of staff to Dr. Deborah Burks. I worked with her and Dr. Fauci to implement our global HIV AIDS program. It's a program that we showed how American leadership can tackle a global pandemic that so many people think is impossible to take on. We need to take a lot of those same uh, results and lessons we've learned from that to apply to this pandemic. We need to make sure that we continue to follow all safe protocols while continue to ramp up testing and diagnostics. We need to continue to ramp up rapid testing, which just last week was announced is now available to first responders here in New Hampshire. We need to invest in a safe and effective and reliable vaccine. Those are the steps we need to take and put politics to the side and get something done. Congressman Pappas, you were invoked 30 seconds. Well, thanks very much. And it hasn't taken long for the negative attacks and the baseless attacks to already start. And at this moment in our history, we've got to focus on what we can do to get the job done in Washington. And we need a better resp response from this administration. My opponent has been a cheerleader for the Trump administration every step of the way. They hid valuable information from the American people that was needed to keep us all safe. They politicized the use of mask wearing. They called testing a double-edged sword. And just this week, they've undermined Dr. Fauci and other public health officials that are trusted voices in this country. So we need leadership that's going to trust the public health community and ensure we can communicate those messages to the American people to keep us all safe and do what we can Congress. to save lives. That's time. A question on Dr. Fauci and testing now for Monica Hernandez. Congressman Pappas, right now the U.S. is testing nearly a million people a day and multiple large-scale vaccine trials are underway. And Dr. Anthony Fauci says a vaccine could be available by early next year, which is record time. Are Democrats too pessimistic about how far the country has come. Well, we need to get help to the American people as quickly as we can, and we continue to need to ramp up testing. You know, we're seeing about a million tests a day in this country, but we really need to be at three to four million tests a day to protect all of our frontline and essential workers and everyone who's out in the community. Testing is the best way that we can stay ahead of COVID-19, make sure we're identifying it, isolating it, doing the contact tracing that's needed to prevent the spread. Now, we're lucky here in New Hampshire that our numbers are low, but we all have to stay vigilant to keep it in that place. And this means that Congress needs to act to provide the necessary resources, both in terms of the personal protective equipment and supplies, but also to ramp up our testing effort. We desperately need these resources. I'll continue to call on FEMA and the administration to deploy them in a way that can save lives here in New Hampshire. And when it comes to a vaccine, we hope and pray this is approved as quickly as possible. We need a vaccine that's going to be safe and effective to protect us and allow us to put COVID-19 in the rearview mirror. And that means we need to pass a package that allows us to ramp up the deployment of a vaccine and make sure that we have the materials necessary to get it out as quickly as we possibly can. Next question from John DeStaso. Good evening, gentlemen. And Congressman Pappas, continuing our look at COVID-19, uh, there is worry that people are becoming fatigued. Just last week in, in the state of New Hampshire, we heard about cases of people allegedly breaking quarantine and isolation. What specific metrics would you use to determine if there should be widespread shutdowns and should the federal government supersede states that are not quelling outbreaks fast enough? Well, we want to do everything we can to avoid a second shutdown because our local businesses can't afford that, our workers can't afford it, uh, our healthcare system, frankly, can't afford it. That's why we need to take the steps necessary to prepare uh, the American people and the people of New Hampshire uh, with the provisions we need to do the testing, treatment, and tracing, uh, and make sure we have all the supplies necessary to weather some very tough months coming up this winter. As I said, we've kept our numbers low here in New Hampshire because people believe in science, they're staying vigilant but we can't get complacent at all. Uh, really, the health and safety of the American people is at stake right now. We all have a part to play, 
uh, and we all need to make sure we're moving in the same direction. Now, we all have to, as elected officials and as candidates for office, be modeling good behavior, and that means lifting up public health messages. I was proud early on in this pandemic to hold tele-town hall meetings that nearly 100,000 Granite Staters participated in, where we elevated the voices of our pub public health community. Uh, that's how we're getting messages out to the people of New Hampshire that can keep them safe. We all have a role to play in this effort. And Mr. Maurer, same question. Well, look, you keep hearing Congressman Pappas say Congress should do this, Congress should do that, Congress should get relief. Well, Congressman, you're in Congress. If you want to get this done, you could go down there right now. In fact, uh, you know, I was at a diner the other day, and it's called Ryan's Place in Epping. I was there last Friday morning having breakfast, and a business owner, a small business owner, came to me with a tear in her eye because she started that restaurant named after her son who passed away while in, the line, while in active duty. It's a testament to him. It's an honor to him. Yet she can't get access to Paycheck Protection Program funding right now because Congress is sitting on its hands not doing anything. Congressman, we were on a call just on Friday with the Portsmouth Chamber, and you said you want to get everyone in the room and throw away the key. Well, why, where's the key? Get down there. Go to Washington, D.C. You know there's something called a discharge petition right down on the floor of the Congress right now. It means you can take a standalone vote on the Paycheck Protection Program. You've not signed it. You know why? Because Nancy Pelosi won't let you do it. You're beholden to her, and you're letting small businesses in New Hampshire fall behind. Well, Adam, I absolutely support efforts to get relief out to our small businesses. And go and do it, Congressman. And I'll support any bill that will provide the necessary help. And I don't need a lecture from someone who moved here for a political career That's just not true, about the vibrancy of our small business community here in New Hampshire and what they need. We fought every step of the way to put resources on the table. We passed the Paycheck Protection Program as part of the CARES Act. We put more funding into it to make sure that it got out to the smallest businesses who needed help. And we ensured that it had the flexibility that it needed based on the feedback that we got from New Hampshire businesses. Now, I voted for two major packages, the HEROES Act that Matt Mowers opposed. That would have provided the support we need it, but we've got to get a deal done. That's I'm time. encouraged that there are some good signs this week. We've got to get this over the finish line to help New Hampshire business owners and workers. Well, I told you the congressman would say a few things tonight and then not do follow through on in Washington, D.C. You didn't expect it to happen so early in the debate. But, Congressman, that, that uh, HEROES Act you talked about would provide billions of dollars for the release of violent felons from prison. We provide billions of dollars of uh, stimulus checks to illegal immigrants at a time when our small businesses were hurting. Let's not forget, Congressman, you were on a call at the outset of COVID-19 with your party leadership where they said, let's use this as an opportunity to advance our agenda. This isn't a time for agendas. This is a time to put the American people first. We've all been Im impacted by this. This is absolutely deliver a, help, this, this is absolutely Go a time. Go do your job. This is absolutely a time to put the American people first, Matt. And I've been fighting for that each and every step of the way. I've signed letters. I've called on leadership to come to the table and cut a deal. What have we seen? The president tweeted last week that he wanted to end negotiations. Uh, Mitch McConnell this week said he's advising the White House not to come to the table and do a deal before the election. We've got to fix this. And the only way I know how to do it is to vote for legislation, co-sponsor legislation, call on our leadership to do it, and bring the stories of everyday Granite Staters down to Washington, D.C. I continue to do that. I continue to be informed by the stories that I hear all across our state. And we've got to act as quickly as we possibly can on this, and I'm committed to it. That's time, 15 seconds. Yeah, very, very briefly, I mean, Congressman, you continue to say you want to call out leadership. You've never said one single thing about your leader, Nancy Matt, Pelosi. I have. You voted with her 100% of the time. Matt, that's not true. It is true, Congressman. Matt, that look, is not actually, true. Actually, for everyone at that home, because, look, the Congressman gets Matt a little cites unruly this false right now. He, it's, it's, it's actually online. Every... If folks want to go online and actually look Let's it up, move they can on go to, to ProPublica, see his voting record. Let, he votes let me for just Nancy say, Pelosi Matt, the Speaker, the the Speaker of the House does not vote. The Speaker of the House has voted a few. The Speaker of the House has voted a few dozen times. I've taken over 900 votes in the House. 80% of those have been bipartisan votes. So know your facts, Matt. Well, actually, okay, can I just have one real quick We're going to move on to the next question. Yeah. There'll be plenty of time okay. to get to all of the debate, but we do want to move on to the next question. It's coming from a student, Kenneth Tran at St. Anselm College. Fantastic. I've been a Manchester, New Hampshire resident my entire life, and I'm currently a sophomore at St. Anselm College. As I'm sure you both know, COVID relief talks have been stalled for months now, and it doesn't look like any relief will be coming anytime soon. COVID cases are rising again, and there looks to be no hope left for individuals and businesses that are reeling from the pandemic. These individuals are going to be your constituents, and these businesses, such as retail stores, restaurants, bars, airlines, movie theaters, pretty much everything, are going to be depending on you for relief. My question for both of you is that if you are elected, what would you push for in a realistic, bipartisan COVID stimulus bill? That goes first to you, Mr. Mauer. Sure. Thank you, Adam. And thank you for that question. It's a great one. And thank, thank you for your dedication to our community as well. Uh, you know, look, I've already, already said we need to expand the Paycheck Protection Program, especially for businesses that have been disproportionately affected. You know, a lot of my neighbors work in restaurants. 
Some of my uh, neighbors actually ha own restaurants. Uh, they need help right now. The weather is cooling and the temperatures are turning. They need a lifeline right now, but instead they're playing politics in Washington, D.C. It's the same old, same old down there. We need folks who are actually going to get things done. I'd also, by the way, support making sure that our schools have uh, uh, payment for PPE so that students can go back in a health and safe way. We need to make sure also that expenditures accrued by the state and local governments are covered by COVID-19, a position I've long fought for. And the fact of the matter is that we can be doing this right now in a bipartisan way. Unfortunately, because they're trying to put agendas and unnecessary spending in a bunch of bills right now, they're actually holding progress That's back in true. Congress. And if Congressman Pappas was willing to go down to D.C. and get his job done, then That's maybe we true. could actually be able to deliver some real relief to the people of New Hampshire. So, Adam and Kenneth, thanks very much for the question. And this is the crucial question is, how can we bring people together around solutions? You know, we have been through the last five months after the House passed the HEROES Act on May 15th, when Mitch McConnell said we needed to take a pause, and when the president said this virus is going to magically disappear. My opponent opposed that bill. He said nothing at the time. So look, we need to get relief done, and it does have to have some important facets, including significant support for our local businesses to keep workers employed. Now, in the first round of Paycheck Protection Program, that protected to over 250,000 jobs across the state of New Hampshire. Vital program. In addition to that, support for individuals who are out of work through no fault of their own. Support for affordable child care, making sure we can create safe environments in our schools, and ensuring that we have relief to state governments and local communities. This is an issue that I've worked hard on. I have the support of all the mayors of both parties in the state, all the county commissioners. Matt Mowers opposes direct revenue to That's our local communities. True. Congressman, to you can make up your own record. No, Don't Matt Mowers mind, opposes funding to our local communities to deal with there lost revenue. He, there he goes. You said that to the union leader on August 6th. Actually, actually, read my quote, Congressman. They did, and they actually corrected the story that you keep putting out. Well, but you here's, said, here's what I'll no, say. No, no, here's but my you position. said you, Congressman, you support Congressman, measures. Let me talk. Congressman, so, let's give him 30 seconds to respond. Look, I stand with Governor Sununu to make sure that we get the COVID relief that we need in New Hampshire. By the way, it's one of the reasons why Governor Sununu has endorsed my campaign, because he needs a teammate down in Washington, D.C. Someone's going to work with him to actually deliver relief for the people and businesses that need it. Unfortunately, Congressman Pappas has been part of the problem down there. He votes with his party leadership. 100% of the time, it's instead of delivering for the people of New Hampshire. So, Congressman, I, I, a lot of happy talk. You're saying a lot of nice things. Why don't you go down there and actually get it done? We have been working on this issue. We have passed multiple bills that Matt Mowers has opposed. And I think what's encouraging right now is the Speaker continues to negotiate with Secretary Mnuchin. Uh, the Secretary um, has indicated that things are going well. They have terms down on paper. And I want to see that effort get over the finish line. This relief can't wait. That's why I've supported two major packages, why I've continued to support anything that comes for a vote in the floor to provide necessary help to the people of the state at this point in time. Matt Mowers is looking to a score political points. A lot of talk and over I'm there. Looking to get the job talk. done. Let's get to the next question from Monica Hernandez. Well, let's follow up that question from Kenneth about stimulus money. Now, what is the one thing Congress can do that would make it easier for companies to create jobs and lower unemployment? And uh, Congressman Pappas, we'll start with you. Well, thanks very much. We have seen our unemployment rate come down in New Hampshire, but the concern is that people are dropping out of the workforce. We have a lot of women who have dropped out of the workforce, 800,000 across the country last month alone. Child care uh, continues to be a barrier, and our education system uh, puts a lot of pressure on our working families. So we got to get our help out to the school districts who need it and support for affordable child care. In addition to that, we've got to open up another round of support to our small businesses. As I mentioned, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program had a success successful record at connecting more than 250,000 folks in our state to work. For those people who can't return safely to work, we've got to make sure that they can meet basic household expenses. I support additional unemployment aid to individuals who are out of work right now. We've seen nearly a third of our households miss a housing payment month after month. There's a lot of financial strain on our families right now, and we've got to work to make them whole. So I think we've got to take up these issues in the next package, um, and we have to look at all the financial stresses that our family is facing. And then we have to have the conversation about how we can support our workforce needs over the long run and get this economy back up on its feet with stimulus. Mr. Maurer, same question. Sure. Well, look, first and foremost, uh, Governor Sununu has done a tremendous job in our state working with small businesses to get people back to work. It's the reason why you see New Hampshire leading the nation right now and actually with one of the lowest unemployment rates uh, in the country. But there's so much more work that needs to be done. And Governor Sununu needs a teammate down in Washington, D.C. to actually get that done. 
It's someone who's actually going to put partisan politics aside and fight for the people of New Hampshire. Someone who's going to deliver for Paycheck Protection Program expansion of funding. Now, there's $100 billion sitting unutilized right now in the Paycheck Protection Program that we could open up for businesses. That's something that can be done today, but unfortunately, politics in Congress is not allowing it to get done. We need to continue to create an environment so that jobs can come back, that businesses can flourish. Yet here's the problem. Congressman Pappas right now, literally is supporting a repeal of every single tax cut from two years ago. It would actually That's hurt middle-income families. And That's not only not that, true. he's the sponsor of a bill right now on the floor that would increase the payroll tax by 20 percent on every American. That's, That's not going to help middle-class families in this pandemic, Congressman. 15, 30 seconds to respond on taxes, well, Congressman, and then we're moving well, on. Well, sure. Let me just say I have been a partner of the governor's, and I'll work with whoever is governor. I worked with Governor Sununu when I was a counselor, and he was the governor. And New Hampshire has a great record of our delegation working in a bipartisan fashion with this governor. On taxes, my opponent wants to bring up this issue because he wants to distract from the fact that he wants to repeal the Affordable Care Act and end a woman's right to choose. The fact is I don't support tax increases for working people, middle class We're families, right now, and our small businesses. And right the now. fact is... Well, we need to make sure that the big corporations and the wealthy pay their fair share. I don't support increasing taxes on our middle class families and our small businesses. That wouldn't be right in the middle of this pandemic. And I'll make sure I support fair tax policy moving forward. You were invoked on the Affordable Care Act quickly, and then sure. we have to move on. Very, very briefly, like I said in the outset, Congressman Pappas is going to look in the camera and tell you a bunch of things. Yet right now, literally right now, Congressman Pappas is the co-sponsor of a bill that would increase the payroll tax by 20 percent on every American. So, Congressman, stop misleading everyone. Let's be truthful with the people of New Hampshire. They've earned it. Okay. Matt, I don't support tax increases on working Then why people. are you the sponsor that of a is tax a bill, hike that right is a now, bill, Congressman? That is you a bill that looks to protect Gentlemen, Congressman, Social you could go Security. To DC Let's right move now on to the next question. The bill, but you won't. Matt, but it's going to come from John DeStaso. Okay, thank you. Congressman Pappas, you voted in favor of the George Floyd criminal justice bill which would ban no-knock warrants and stop the flow of military surplus equipment to police departments. But it would also take the step of uh, removing qualified immunity, which would mean officers could be personally sued for actions on the job. New Hampshire's Democratic Senators Hassan and Shaheen do not support this. Uh, Mr. Mowers has harshly criticized you for this. Why are they wrong? Well, thanks for the question, John. I'm glad we can talk about this issue here tonight. And look, I, after the murder of George Floyd, I supported bipartisan legislation in Congress to address this issue, to address the issue of policing in our country and to try to save lives. It had some basic provisions in it, like banning no-knock warrants and chokeholds and requiring greater accountability in our police departments, things that are being implemented right now here in New Hampshire. I have nothing but respect and admiration for the law enforcement community. And I wasn't willing to look the other way after George Floyd's murder. I think we gotta bring our country together around a conversation that can figure out how to solve these problems, how to focus our community policing resources where it can make the most difference. After those conversations with law enforcement, I introduced a piece of legislation legislation that's already passed the House. It's a new grant program to create accreditation funds for local police departments. When they get accredited, they can implement best practices, improve professionalism. It's a great way to transform law enforcement, and it's embraced by the law enforcement community here. So that's just one of the things that's come out of my conversations with local law enforcement, and I want to see something happen. Unfortunately, the Senate stonewalled us. Mitch McConnell wouldn't allow a vote, wouldn't put up that's a piece time. of legislation, and we're left with nothing. And I don't think that's acceptable. And Mr. Mowers, you oppose getting rid of qualified immunity, but in the wake of cases like George Floyd, shouldn't there be some middle ground to make bad officers more directly responsible uh, for bad and sometimes deadly acts? Well, John, we do need to make sure that law enforcement that steps out of line is held accountable. And you're seeing that happen in Minneapolis right now. The officer who committed that tragedy, it was a tragedy, is actually going through criminal proceedings right now. But here's what Congressman Pappas did. Despite the fact that he told law enforcement two years ago he would support them, he didn't. In June, he voted to strip away this qualified immunity. And let me tell you what that would do. It would allow criminals to launch frivolous lawsuits against our cops. By the way, it's why New Hampshire's uh, P Police Association has endorsed my campaign. It's the reason why the two Manchester police unions that endorsed Congressman Pappas two years ago are now supporting my campaign. It's the reason why I've been endorsed by the New England Police Benevolent Association. In fact, Congressman Pappas hasn't been, is the only major Democrat candidate who hasn't been endorsed by a single police organization. Not only that, when Congressman Pappas was asked why he voted for this by law enforcement, his words to them were that his party 
majority leadership needed his That's vote, and he didn't think the vote, the law, That's it would become true, law man. anyway. Congressman, are you true. calling the law enforcement liars now? No, I'm they, not. They, they I, were I not on limb, Congressman, and supported you. And I'm happy to tell you and, Well, then why did you have it before you voted the, on the bill, And look, I'm always willing to hear people out, Matt, and I think we all have a role to play in this conversation to improve policing and have the and conversation before lives. you vote to strip look, away a critical protection from law enforcement. Matt, this is about a process. And it's about making sure we can take steps forward in this country to achieve justice for all and to keep our community safe. You think those things are mutually exclusive. No, I don't, Congressman. And in I fact, don't. I, and the fact is, I'm the one who's fighting for funding for our local communities through COVID relief legislation to protect the jobs of our local as, law enforcement. As will I, but I'm the one who fought to restore cuts that the president proposed to make to the COPS program. He proposed cutting it by 58%. We worked in the House to restore it. So those are my priorities. I'll continue to fight for the resources that our law enforcement needs to do their jobs and to keep our communities safe. Let's go to our next question from Monica Hernandez. Well, the president of the NAACP has said the first step to combating systemic racism is acknowledging that it exists, including the legacy of practices that discriminate against home ownership and wealth, and that studies that have shown that offenders of color are more likely to get harsher sentences than white offenders for the same crimes. Mr. Mowers, in our last debate here at WMUR, you said you do not believe systemic racism exists. Congressman Pappas, you have said you do believe systemic racism is real. If people can't agree on this, how can society move forward on this issue? And how would you convince your opponent tonight that your position is the right one? Mr. Mowers, we'll start with you. Monica, thank you for the question. It is an important topic because I think the root of this is that there's folks out there who don't feel like they're part of the fabric of American society. We should be doing everything we can to make sure everyone feels like they have a seat at the table so they can get their piece of the American dream. And there's a lot of steps we can do by uh, opening up uh, educational opportunities, by trying to expand housing opportunities, by ensuring that there's uh, uh, good paying jobs for everyone in every community. Those are things we can do. But Monica, while we have that conversation, while we can get that done, we can also at the same time stand by law enforcement. They're being asked to do more and more every single day, and yet they're being asked to do it with less and less. And by uh, voting to remove qualified immunity, which again will allow criminals to sue cops, something so extreme that actually some leaders of the NAACP here in New Hampshire uh, op oppose changing, yet Congressman Pappas wants to get rid of that. That would put cops at risk and make it harder for them to keep our communities safe. That's why I'm such a big proponent of this. We need to keep good cops on the job because that's going to be a way to keep our communities safe and address a lot of those issues you just talked about, Monica. Congressman, same question. Well, the issue was about systemic racism, and I don't think he acknowledged that it does exist. And it's manifests itself in so many different aspects of our society, in education, in healthcare, in so many different aspects of community life. And we've got to identify it. We've got to root it out. We've got to have tough conversations about how we can move forward as a country while leaving no one behind. We've got to make sure that we're uh, coming closer and closer each and every year to the promise of our founding for all Americans, regardless of their race, color, or creed. You know, here in New Hampshire, black women are six times times more likely to catch COVID than white women, uh, and Latinos four times more likely to come down with COVID than Caucasians. I think that's a problem, and we've got to make sure that we're identifying ways that we can get resources out to vulnerable communities here in New Hampshire uh, to help close that injustice. Um, so I am all in on this conversation. I find inspiration in people who are recognizing this in our own communities and in our country. And I want to continue to listen to all sides and find ways that we can move forward together fundamentally as a country without leaving people out. Okay, gentlemen, we're going to move now to a lightning round. These are quick 15 second answers. Right. Don't get struck. Okay, first to you, Congressman Pappas. If you could personally set the minimum wage, what would it be? Well, today I would set it for $12 an hour, and I think we should look to grow it over time at the rate of inflation. I voted for legislation that would raise it over the course of six years to $15. Mr. Mowers, how about you? Where would you set the minimum wage? I want every family to be able to have a livable wage, and I think those decisions are best left in the state and local level. Uh, unfortunately, Congressman Pappas actually voted for a higher federal minimum wage than he pays in his own restaurant. Actually, yeah. they posted a job opening for well, less than the $15. It's phased in over six days. years, Matt. Moving on. Next question, Mr. Mowers. It's become controversial in Washington to advocate for additional COVID economic relief funding for entertainment venues like those found on Broadway. But is there a local venue in District 1 that you believe needs the help? Sure. There's actually a, um, a number. I'll tell you one in particular. Uh, I actually close with uh, Al Flurry, who owns a bunch of local entertainment venues uh, out on the seacoast. I think it's important for that. Um, also to make sure that um, the pavilion up in Gil um, Guilford has funding as well. I attended concerts there, gosh, almost eight years ago. Had a great time. Want to make sure that we can uh, make sure they're still opening so when we get 
control of this pandemic, we can actually go back and enjoy a good concert. Congressman Pappas. Well, uh, Tupelo Music Hall in Derry, I was there to promote the Save Our Stages Act recently, which passed through the House as the part of the last COVID bill, it should be included in the next package, because our entertainment venues, our, our music halls and theaters around the state are part of the culture of what makes New Hampshire such a great place to live. We've got to protect them through these tough winter months. Congressman Pappas, is the Confederate battle flag a symbol of racism, yes or no? Yes. Mr. Mowers? Mr. Mowers, do you always wear a seatbelt or do you sometimes choose to take the live for your diet approach? <laughs> I, uh, I almost always wear a seatbelt. I can't promise that sometimes when I'm going Dunkin' Donuts down the street, I've always got it on, but I usually try to have it. Congressman Pappas? I do. And New Hampshire has high seatbelt rate usage, actually. And Congressman Pappas, what's an example of an attack in this race that you believe has gone too far against you? Well, we've seen it time and again, the mailers from these dark money super PACs and the Mowers campaign that show me, uh, you know, marching with Chinese communist soldiers or with oh, rioters, and it's just totally outrageous. I mean, it's become a cartoon, Matt, and this is a campaign to represent the people of this district. This is about the issues that matter to people most, and I just think your campaign of fear and smear is falling flat. Mr. Mowers, a, a negative attack against you that sure. you believe is Sure, I mean, look, Congressman, you just sent out a mail piece two days ago that attacked me. You know, you know, it's the fact of the matter is you can't have this hypocrisy. You can't have it both ways. You've actually been running a very nasty negative campaign, Congressman. Not only that's, that, you're misleading the voters true. in New Hampshire every single day on your record. That's not true. You know, I have no problem talking about the fact that you've undermined law enforcement, the fact that you prioritized uh, China, Chinese true. workers over American workers, the fact that you also uh, are voting for a massive tax hike in D.C. That's your record, though. So I'd expect you could defend it. Quick response. You can go. Well, I, I mean, I think it's just more of the same, and he wants to deflect from the real issues at hand where he's out of step with the people in New Hampshire on health care, on choice, on the environment, and so many other crucial issues. I think we're going to get to some more of those. Let's go now to John DeStaso. Thank you. The New York Times analysis of the president's taxes has renewed the conversation about the tax code. Billionaire Warren Buffett has noted the absurdity of his secretary paying a higher tax rate than him. The average American pays $11,000 in federal income taxes. Should the wealthy pay more in taxes than they do now? Are you in favor of closing loopholes for certain people or companies to avoid taxes? And if so, which loopholes specifically should be closed? Congressman, would you answer that first, please? Well, thanks. That's an important question. And I think there is an imbalance with uh, millionaires and billionaires in this country who do well and have low tax burden, uh, even lower than some of the people that work for their companies. We have 60 Fortune 500 companies in this country that have zero tax liability or had it last year. And look, over my lifetime, we've seen the gap in income inequality grow and grow. And so we've got to make sure we're making smart investments in this country that everyone is paying their fair share. I'll reiterate, I don't support raising taxes on middle class families, working people, and our small businesses. And that's where I think we need to look to provide the support. Look, we also have to take away the subsidies that exist uh, for industries like the oil and gas industry. We've got to make sure that we're putting the incentives in the right place and that our budgets, our, our tax code, are really statements of value about the type of future that we can create in this country. Um, so I'll stand up to the special interests in Washington who like to get these uh, you know, specialized breaks. Matt Mowers is the special oh, interest on, because he, he has true. cashed in That's after he true. left the White House. He's working for the big drug companies and D.C. lobbying firms. He's not no. representing the people of it's New not Hampshire. true, Congressman. If, if I could respond, or do you want me to answer the whole question? You can take both. Well, why don't, why don't we start on talking about tax policy? The fact of the matter is that Congressman Pappas is supporting a tax hike in Washington, D.C. right now. He has an opportunity if he wants to get off this stage, go down to D.C., take his name off the bill that would raise taxes on the middle income, middle income Americans, but he's chosen not to. So we've seen that. In fact, Governor Sununu and I are going to protect the New Hampshire way, keep taxes low, keep spending in check. Congressman Pappas wants to do the D.C. way. And Congressman, you want to talk about relationships with corporate special interests. With all due respect, you've been dating a corporate lobbyist who actually was lobbying on behalf of Amazon at a time when you then went on to cast 10 separate votes on Amazon's behalf on bills they that's lobbied true, you on. Man. Yes, it is, Congressman. Matt, it absolutely not true. is. In fact, you Matt, know, even that on That is not true. It absolutely is. And how is. dare you? Because look, you're the, you're the one who Congressman, gets you just, paid by pharmaceutical companies no, and see, DC special interests let me, let me take back after you left the Trump administration. That's not true. The fact and if that shows that where you're doing the bidding for a lot, bunch of corporate special that is interests not true, in DC, man. you're dating a corporate lobbyist. That is not Which, true. Which, by man. the way, you know, the fact of the matter is you never disclosed it. You never disclosed that is it to not the true, people man. of New Hampshire. In Matt, fact, there's actually rules and regulations. You have to disclose that, especially gifts from lobbyists, Matt, to the House Ethics Committee, something you've never done. So, Congressman, here's an opportunity for you to come out and speak the truth. This is an outrageous charge. 30 seconds and to look, respond. Matt Mowers is someone who worked for the Trump administration. He left and cashed in 
on his relationships from that's that administration you can and started getting you paid want. by – I've read your personal financial disclosure, Matt. You get it's, paid by the big can. drug it's companies. You get paid by D.C. lobbying firms. You're representing their interests and not it's the not interests true. of the and people of New Hampshire. Why and you to go after me personally I'm like this going after you is personally, really disgusting, I'm not, no, And there's no place for that on this debate stage. I'm not going after you personally. What I just want to know is why you haven't disclosed the fact that you have a relationship with a corporate lobbyist. I do not, voted 10 separate times on issues that Amazon lobbied you on. Matt, that is all out true. there. Congressman, that it's that all is out not there. True, you can Matt. talk to anyone in Let's move on to the next question from Monica Hernandez. Well, the COVID pandemic is affecting every part of the economy, including Social Security. A just released report by the Congressional Budget Office shows the impact on retirement funds. Now, according to their data, under current law, the balance of the trust fund for old age and survivors insurance will be depleted in 2031. What specific proposal do you have to immediately address this safety net? Mr. Mowers, we'll start with you. Well, let me start by saying we need to protect Social Security for those who are on it and anyone nearing retirement age. I mean, my dad's now on Social Security. It's been part of his retirement planning for a long time. We need to protect it for those. Let's not forget that everyday Americans are paying into that system every single day, and they're doing it with a commitment that they're actually going to get something in return when they retire. Now, we can have a conversation for younger employees right now, younger workers, about how it's going to look in the future. You know, I personally don't know if Social Security is going to be there when I retire, um, but I've got plenty of years to make it up. So we can have that conversation about the best way to move forward. But I can tell you a way not to solve this problem is raising taxes in the middle of a pandemic. Something that Congressman Pappas is currently the sponsor of, of a bill on the floor of the House that would raise the payroll tax by 20%. Now, he's going to tell you that's for Social Security, and that's all fine. But what I'll tell you is that if you do that right now, that's going to disincentivize workers from getting back to work, and it's going to stop the economic progress that Governor Sununu is working so hard to bring to New Hampshire. And so, Congressman Pappas, same question. Well, I believe Social Security is a foundational program, and we have to make sure it's strong for today's retirees as well as tomorrow's. Unfortunately, Matt, you support a dangerous plan that would raise the retirement age That's to true, 69, and you also support means testing and cutting benefits for our seniors. Also not true, Congressman. So I am MLPC supporting stuff, legislation though. to make sure that we can shore up Social Security. And there are lots of ideas on the table. I think we should consider them. But we've got to make sure that we're not going back on our promise to our seniors. This is an earned benefit after all. It's kept seniors out of poverty. We need to make sure that it's there uh, for this generation and the next and for today's workers who are paying into this system. Now, right now, millionaires and billionaires pay Social Security tax on a small fraction of their income, whereas working people, say someone earning $80,000 a year, pays on 100% of their income. Um, by looking at that issue, we could make Social Security solvent until the end of the next century, and that's why I have endorsed um, you know, considering that idea and bringing it to the floor for discussion. In addition to that, we've got to make sure that we're looking at all the needs of our seniors moving forward, especially through this tough time. So we've got to meet their health care needs as well through Medicare. Uh, that's important that we protect that and make sure we don't see cuts that's in Medicare. Time. We're going to get to another question now from Monica Hernandez. Well, the FBI director has warned of foreign interference in the 2020 U.S. presidential election with a steady stream of misinformation aimed at sapping Americans' confidence in the election process. The director of the National National Counterintelligence and Security Center has said that Russia, China and Iran are all trying to inf interfere in the November 3rd election. Mr. Mowers, American democracy is under attack. Should the president be doing more to defend the country? Well, I think we all need to be doing more. And, uh, you know, this is actually an issue I've worked on. I served at the State Department for two years and had the opportunity to see some of these issues up close. Um, I've had the opportunity to actually work with organizations within the State Department to actually counter uh, propaganda campaigns and election interference from Russia and China. It's something we all take seriously. I mean, our democracy in our, this republic is the underpinning of everything that allows us to be standing on here disagreeing on issues today. Folks need to know that the integrity of their vote matters. And so we need to ensure that we're providing more funding, we're providing more awareness, that the federal government is providing more guidance to states to ensure that they are protected from potential hacking from foreign uh, uh, observers or foreign interference. It's so vitally important. We all need to have trust in this republic and our democracy. And so I've worked on these issues before. I look forward to working on them again when I get to Congress. Representative Pappas, why is foreign interference in U.S. elections being met with such a passive response from the U.S. Congress? 
Well, it shouldn't be because it's happening in real time. We see it in this election. We saw it in the 2016 election. And we got warnings from our intelligence community that have been made public about the fact that Russia seeks to sow discord and push disinformation in this campaign, and that Iran and China as well are looking at ways to uh, influence our elections, though they're not actively taking any participation right now. We've got to secure our systems. We passed legislation in the House to do that, a bill called the SHIELD Act, uh, that would have uh, prevented that kind of outside influence. Unfortunately, Mitch McConnell stood in the way in the Senate and wouldn't take up the bill. You know, this administration time and again has cozied up to uh, dictators like Vladimir Putin and has thrown the interests of the United States of America and our democracy under the bus. And so we need someone in Congress who's going to be willing to uh, push back on that, ask the tough questions, and make sure that we put up safeguards for our democracy. There should be no foreign meddling in our elections. American people should be deciding American elections. Next question from John DeStaso. Thank you. And Congressman Pappas, while members of the House don't have any direct involvement in, in approving Supreme Court justices, you may be called upon the next term to vote on court-related issues. If a bill to expand the number of justices on the Supreme Court came in front of you, would you vote for it? Why or why not? Well, I've said I would vote against it. And I think it's really important that we focus on how we can elect someone to represent the people of this district who's going to stand up for health care and stand up for a woman's right to choose. Those issues hang in the balance with this Supreme Court nomination, and it's really maddening. At a point in time where the Senate won't even take up COVID relief legislation, they can clear everything off the decks to take up this Supreme Court nomination that seeks to achieve those two end goals that Matt Mowers supports. Look, the Affordable Care Act is a foundational law, and we need someone in Congress who's going to be fighting for health care as a right and not a privilege. I think of people across this district, like Bev in Madbury, who's got a son with diabetes, who's worried, worried about his health care future. Future. I think about people that I meet each and every day that have a pre-existing condition. 570,000 people in New Hampshire with a pre-existing condition. They would be left without protection if the effort that my opponent supports true, succeeds to strip true. away the Come Affordable on. Care Act. So that's why we need someone who's been walking the walk on this issue, as I've been doing the last couple of years. I'll stand up for the health care of the people of this country. Matt Maurer that's stands with the special interests and the insurance companies. See, that's just not true. Once again, Congressman Pappas has taken a page out of the D.C. playbook. I've said consistently that I will always support protecting those with pre-existing conditions. Congressman Pappas wants to keep trying to lie about everything on this side. You know, Congressman, you want to rewrite your record, that's fine, but don't try to rewrite my statements. The fact of the matter is that I support ensuring that we have expanded health care access. We need to protect those with pre-existing conditions, but we need to do it in a but way how? that's affordable. Congressman, but you, you, you support, effort, you support efforts that would actually uh, what d is have your doubled, plan to protect doubled people the premiums. With pre -existing conditions? Con Congressman, you don't I've have heard, one. I absolutely do. Congressman, look, this is the petty politics that might go well on the House floor down there, but don't bring them here to New Hampshire. The fact of the matter is that you're continuing to mislead. You've sent mail out on this. You want to talk about a nasty negative campaign? You've been sending mail out on this. Here's the fact. I want to support expanded access to health care for every single person. The difference between Congressman Pappas and I that is he already great, supports plans no that have plan. actually doubled premiums. No plan in there. fact, I met a woman in Greenland just the other day. She told me that in December she was laid off for the first time in her life. She went to start her own sole proprietorship, pulling herself back up. But she went to go get a health care plan, and all that was available was a $500 a month high deductible plan, one that six years ago would have actually cost half that price. But because of Congressman Pappas's health care plan, that's Matt, now you doubled. Have no plan. And the fact of the you matter have is, no plan. That's what I have. I've actually talked a lot about the fact that we need to provide tax credits to small businesses to provide better health care for their employees, increasing health savings accounts, tax deductibility, so people keep more of their own money for the health care outcomes, expanding a ability health savings to pool. Account is not going to. That. That's time. Uh, yes. First to the Supreme Court question, though, before we give. Congressman Pappas, a rebuttal, would you vote to add justices to the Supreme Court? Absolutely not. I, I think that, you know, the way it's set up now matters. I also am a firm believer in the Constitution, something Congressman Pappas may want to change because he's talked about getting rid of the Electoral College even. That's how out of step he is. Congressman Pappas, well, your response You on know, I, I visited with people all week, and not one person's mentioned the Electoral College, but almost to a person, the they mentioned their health care, and they mentioned their pre-existing conditions. And that's why we're going to protect them here, is trying actually, to do here is basically throw the uh, people of the United States that's, out of a plane without a parachute. That we need a plan for how we're going to protect people, and it's called the Affordable Care Act. The essential that, that benefits of contained rhetoric within the is Affordable what's Care wrong Act with Washington, and Medicaid expansion and protections for people with pre-existing condition are paramount. I will stand up and protect them. He'll take them See, away. See, once again, I just stood here and looked you in the eye. I told you my plan. Yet Congressman Pappas wants to make up his own interpretation of the truth. I think that's a special tactic they teach you when you go hang out in D.C. too often. Your president I don't, doesn't I don't, have a plan. I don't speak for my party, Congressman. I know you vote 100% of the time your, your party. I won't, because I'm going to put the people in New 
Hampshire for four first. years with this administration great, saying there's some what? secret health care plan for two years and just you around the corner. For this. Matt, I have. I've passed legislation on a bipartisan basis to protect people with pre-existing conditions, to lower the cost of prescription drugs. Actually, My actually, opponent gets paid haven't. by That's the big true. pharmaceutical companies. Again, you're just I want to take them up. on and negotiate lower prices for the people. If I could just to pull one other Supreme Court question out of this. Congressman Pappas, would you be in favor of a constitutional amendment that would put a limit on the number of years that justices could serve on the Supreme Court? I don't think so. I think people, uh, you know, well into their later years are active justices. We saw that with Justice Ginsburg. Uh, and so I don't think we need that. Mr. Mowers? No, I wouldn't, because uh, actually the reason the founders set that up was to remove political interference of the court process, to make sure they never had any sort of reason that they would have to come back for a reconfirmation. I don't think we need to have a cap on the number of years or an age. Let's go to another question from John DeStaso. Thank you. So we, uh, of course, have spoken about qualified immunity, but there are other aspects to the debate over policing in America. The National Conference of State Legislatures says there is no national governing body that enforces nationwide education certifications for peace officers and no nationwide standards for policing. So uh, to Mr. Mowers first, should there be or should it continue to be left up to the individual states? And if so, what standards should be in place? Sure. Well, John, great question. In fact, many of our uh, law enforcement departments here in New Hampshire are cer certified by what's called CLIA. Uh, so Manchester, Portsmouth, a number of larger towns, even towns like Goffstown are CLIA certified. We should be expanding the opportunity for more smaller departments to have that type of training and certification. We can do that in a way by working with the states. I don't think we need to have a federal mandate to do that. We can encourage it. We can provide some funding for it, which is important, but that should be determined between the states and the local police departments. I'll tell you why that works better. And here in New Hampshire, our law enforcement actually already does a lot of the things that were in the different bills in Washington, D.C. You know, they ha we have community policing. A lot of our law enforcement departments are CLIA certified. That's why I'm so bothered by the fact that Congressman Pappas did vote to strip away qualified immunity from our law enforcement, which makes their ability to do their jobs that much more difficult. And the words of police officers here in New Hampshire would actually lead to the largest resignation of cops in our country's history, which would put our communities at risk. Well, thanks for the question, John. And, and once again, I support a process, which is why I supported the George Floyd bill. It's not a I, don't support, voted it, I don't support um, frivolous lawsuits against uh, members of law enforcement who are following their training and doing the right thing. But that's what and, your and vote would do, At the same that's time, the problem. I don't that's support someone do. being having their civil rights violated with impunity either. With respect to the issue that you raised, John, I think it's really important that we have strong standards. Uh, we have a great police standards and training council here in New Hampshire. Uh, we can continue to beef up the training and uh, you know the time that officers are putting into on a regular basis, I think they would support that. But the bill I have introduced uh, with respect to accreditation is important because unfortunately, Matt Mowers is a little bit misled on this. Most of our law enforcement departments here in New Hampshire are not CALEA certified. Many would like to do it, but there's a financial barrier to doing that. Um, they could institute best practices, learn from what's happening around the country, collect better statistics. Uh, it really would be a positive thing. We can get that done if we pass my legislation over the finish line. Next question from Monica Hernandez. Abortion continues to be a divisive issue politically, but a Pew Research Center survey conducted last year showed a majority of Americans said abortion should be legal in all or most cases and do not want to see Roe versus Wade overturned. Mr. Mowers, you have long identified as pro-life. Congressman Pappas, you are pro-choice. Is there a middle ground here? Congressman, you go first. Well, thanks very much for the question. This is an important question because Unlike Matt Mowers, I won't get in the way of a woman uh, pursuing her reproductive health care choices. And I think it's critically important at a point in time where the Supreme Court nomination is being rushed, where Roe versus Wade is in question, that we codify Roe versus Wade in statute. I support an effort to do that in Congress. I'm a member of the Pro-Choice Caucus. I'm a strong supporter of Planned Parenthood. I ran for the Executive Council in New Hampshire to restore funding after it was cut off. And I think that's where we should focus on family planning and basic health services. We have lowered the abortion rate in this country over the last many decades decades by investing in providers like Planned Parenthood and others around the state who provide cancer screenings, annual exams, contraception, counseling, uh, the type of things that are important to critical populations, women, men, and family. It provides uh, better health outcomes. It provides for health security. Uh, it provides for economic security. Uh, and it's something I'm going to continue su to support as a member of Congress. 
Mr. Maurer, same question. Is there a middle ground? Well, I think there's diverse viewpoints on this. I think that everyone's voice should be respected. And I actually agree with one thing the congressman said. We need to expand health care options for women. You know, that's something that I've done in my line of work when I helped run our global HIV AIDS program. You know, we actually expanded the ability for women to receive prenatal care, to expand the ability for them to have early diagnosis and, uh, and treatment. I'm sorry, early diagnosis. Um, for breast cancer, cervical cancer screenings, which are vitally important because if you catch them in their infancy, if you catch them early in early stages, you can treat them and uh, ensure that they're actually prevented for the future. Those are important things that we have to do, that if we expand those options, not just here, but around the world, and that's something I've worked on. It's a vitally important issue. Next question from Monica Hernandez. New Hampshire is getting warmer. The Environmental Protection Agency and UMass Amherst say our state is nearly three degrees warmer now than it was at the turn of the last century. And the EPA says that will likely cause more droughts in the summer and fall, impacting agriculture, and more floods in the winter and spring, threatening homes, businesses, and recreation. Well, this year, New Hampshire experienced its most intense drought since the U.S. Drought Monitor began keeping records in 2000. And the Union of Concerned Scientists estimates that in 25 years, 2,000 New Hampshire homes totaling $645 million in property value will be at risk of chronic flooding. Mr. Mowers, what specific steps would you take to stop these issues in New Hampshire? Well, thank you, Monica. It's an important issue because uh, human activity does contribute to climate change, but there's common sense steps we can take to reduce that. Uh, you know, first and foremost, we have to uh, obviously monitor and evaluate every single restriction that ensures that pollutants in the air are not contaminating the air to a degree that would increase and contribute to climate change. That's something I think we could probably all agree on. But we also, while we're talking about that, we also have to make sure they're holding polluters from other countries accountable. You know, China and India are actually the biggest polluters in the world. And yet right now, they don't have the environmental standards that we have here in the United States. I'd support actually levying tariffs against uh, companies in China and other countries that do actually not hold themselves to the same environmental standards that we do here in the U.S. That's how you're going to ensure that they're pulling their weight towards this overall cause. What I won't do, though, is put American manufacturers and businesses and throw them under the bus at the time when we're letting China and India get away with sending pollutants in the air the way they do. Representative Pappas, what legislation in Congress have you supported to reverse these effects? And specifically, what parts of the legislation do you find most important? Well, climate change is real. It's here. We see it all around us. We see it in our own state along the coast. We see it with the moose population, shorter ski seasons, and it's going to get a lot worse from that. You know, there's an interpretive sign down by the salt marsh and rye that shows that by the year 2100, we're going to see six feet of sea level rise on top of that salt marsh if nothing is done. I don't want to see that future for our New Hampshire. That would be a catastrophe for our economy and our way of life, and the cost of doing nothing is too great. That's why I support legislation to get us to net zero emissions by the year 2050. It's an idea that's endorsed by the League of Conservation Voters and the Sierra Club, two groups supporting my campaign. Um, in addition to that, I work on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and we've done a lot of work on how can we not just rebuild what we have, but rebuild it so it's resilient to climate change, using cleaner and greener materials, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, reducing emissions, more funding for rail projects like we'd like to see here in southern New Hampshire, uh, and in addition to that, a provision I introduced around bike and pedestrian infrastructure, creating local connections, taking cars off the roads. This is the future that we can build together if we have the right leadership in Congress. We're going to move now to our final question. You can have a full minute each to answer this one. First to Mr. Mowers. What one lesson have you taken away from life during the pandemic that you think is most important? Sure. Well, thank you, Adam, because we've all learned quite a bit. I think what I've learned is how much our communities really matter, you know, how much our small businesses matter, how much you know, it really matters every single day when we're all looking out for each other. When you have conflicting messages coming through the media sometimes, when you have conflicting messages coming from Washington, D.C., that our communities have really risen up. And that's what frustrates me so much about Congress. You know, Congress had an opportunity to actually act more quickly and more swiftly. They failed. In fact, Paycheck Protection Program expired in spring of this year, and 4.4 million Americans went unemployed that week. That's the type of inaction which is letting our communities down. What I've also learned and something I've always known, that we, if we work together, if we rise up as a community, if we're willing to put our best faith forward, if we're willing to look out for the best interests of each other and not just try to tear people down the way they do in Washington, D.C., then we can actually get something done. But we also need people who are willing to lead in Washington. We need people who are willing to be an independent voice. I'm willing to do that. I don't care about who, what my party leadership says. I'm not going to let them dictate what's in the best interest of what I do every single day to help the people of New Hampshire. Congressman Pappas, what one lesson have you taken away from life in the pandemic that you think is most important? Well, 
I think it's that we're all connected, that we are truly all in this together. And that's exemplified by the frontline workers we see all across New Hampshire. Uh, the nurses and medical professionals who went in at the beginning of this pandemic not knowing what they'd face on a daily basis, working long hours to save people's lives. Uh, the long-term care workers, our nursing home workers, who saw some really tough situations in nursing homes across the state of New Hampshire, did everything they could to save the lives uh, of their residents. You know, our local law enforcement and police and uh, fire and EMS who have done such a tremendous job at making sure that our communities have what they need uh, and that they're continuing to answer the call and respond. So I think this pandemic has brought out the best in New Hampshire. We've seen the generous spirit of the people of New Hampshire. We've seen the fact that uh, people have are taking this individual responsibility seriously, but they also have deep community concern. And so we need leadership that reflects those values in Washington. I didn't just show up here for a political career. I've lived here my entire life and New Hampshire will always be my home. And I wanna to continue to go to bat for the people of the state to make a difference on the issues that matter. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground tonight and it is time now for our final statements. We've given each candidate one minute for their closing statement and Congressman Pappas, you get to go first. Well, thank you very much, Adam. And I appreciate all the viewers tuning in here tonight. Look, you saw a divergent um, you know, positions on a whole host of important issues to the people of this country. And whether it's health care, reproductive choice, how we're going to bring our communities together, how we're going to fund uh, our coronavirus response, how we're going to take care of climate change, uh, the results and the record couldn't be different between the two of us. I have a record of standing up and fighting for the people of New Hampshire. Matt Mowers, unfortunately, has been fighting for the special interests and Congress fighting for his political it's party his entire adult career. Um, so I'm very concerned about the people at home, the people that are listening right now, and how we can help. You know, I think of someone that I met in Hooksit, a small business owner named um, Bill Forbes, who has a petroleum delivery company. And he said to me when I was at his store that he never thought he would have to ask for help from government, but here he was, and he contacted our office. We helped get him connected to the Paycheck Protection Program. It saved his business and the 12 jobs there. Um, that's just one story about how we're all connected, how we are truly all in this together, and we need to continue to fight with a sense of common purpose as a nation to make a brighter future for us all. Mr. Mowers, your closing statement. Thank you, Adam, and thank you everyone at WMUR for providing this, uh, us this opportunity. You know, the issues I fight for are personal to me. You know, my dad worked for years in marine construction. He helped bring, build piers and pipelines and things like that. In fact, he was actually a diver on the construction of the Seabrook power plant back in the day. My mom was a bartender for a number of years before she picked up odd jobs along the way. That's why it's so personal to me when I say I'm going to work with Governor Sununu to protect the New Hampshire way, to ensure that our taxes are low, to ensure that we're delivering COVID relief, to ensure that we're getting our small businesses employees back on track. Unfortunately, Congressman Pappas hasn't done that. He's had two years now when he looked everyone in the eye and then he went down to D.C. and just followed his party leadership 100 percent of the time. He's undermined law enforcement when they need our help so that they can keep our community safe. He's undermined middle class families when he's proposing one of the largest tax hikes in American history. Those are not things that are going to move our country forward. and They're not things that are going to help New Hampshire. I look forward to earning your trust and your vote in these final few weeks on November 3rd. And most importantly, I look forward to getting to work for you, the people of New Hampshire, and not just being one more locked in vote for Nancy Pelosi the way my opponent has. Thank you, Mr. Mowers. Thank you, Congressman Pappas, for a lively debate tonight. Thank you also to our esteemed panel in the other studio distanced over there. And thank you to you, the viewers, for watching tonight's debate. If you missed any part of this action tonight, you can catch it all on our digital platforms. It's getting posted as we speak. You can join us again tomorrow evening for the candidates for the 2nd Congressional District. And any voting information or questions you might have, please check out our website as well. But check us out tomorrow night for the final installment of the Granite State Debates. Until then, have a good evening.